could sit down. Um, thank you very much for attending this session. Um, great, great honor to be here, and I'm so excited to lead this panel. My name is Yoko Kawai. I am the ex-head of the, uh, the FinTech Center at the Bank of Japan, the Central Bank. And uh, this panel is really, um, it's really phenomenal, I would say. I, the central bank, it's, the, it's like a center of the incumbent, is sitting together with two great startup people. And uh, this is how we, we're going to develop this world, using the technology and changing the world. So that's uh, what I'm looking forward to the hearing, those, hearing to those, uh, those two guys uh, for, the, for what they, they can say to change the world. So uh, the, today's topic, uh, today, the topic of this panel is going to be fintech. And um, well, the, it's not really secret at all that everybody knows that there is a great development in the neighborhood of Japan, in China, that's the, uh, in, the, uh, in the big cities in China, you will never see cash anymore. Everybody's paying with, you, with your smartphones or with the plastic cards. So um, with this cashless society, on the hindsight of that, um, there is great thing going on. It's the accumulation of data. Like all the retail, the retail payments nowadays are transformed into data so that your data is accumulated somewhere on the platform, uh, which is providing the whole range of services. And then like a, based on the data, you can receive very customized services to your convenience. So uh, it's a great change uh, that we're observing in China. And what we can do in Japan is a great question, I think. Uh, we still are the cash-loving country. Uh, the, uh, the, our cash outstanding uh, ratio to GDP is 20%. It, it, is, it, it is very high, actually. Uh, the, in China, it should be around 10%. And in most countries, it's like 10%. Or in Sweden, it's less than 2%. So we are still cash countries. And so that means that we are not really datanized yet in the, in the society. So um, I'm so excited to uh, welcome these two panelists and try to like, listen to them what they are doing and then what, how they can change the world. So let me start. So the first question to these panelists um, is that, well, self-introduction, first of all, your name, uh, your company, what you're doing, why are you doing that, how you want to change the world. So please, go ahead, Tsuji-san. OK, so I'm Yosuke Tsuji, the CEO of Manifold. And for me, like, big surprise is, you know, like, Bank of Japan come to Slash. <laughs> this is, like, a big surprise for me, so. Right, right. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for coming, Yuko. And let me introduce ourselves, the money fraud. So money fraud, we founded money fraud in six years ago, in 2012, and in the very small room at Takada no Baba with six guys. And money fraud mission is, as you see, uh, move your life forward through our services. So before I founded money fraud, I worked for Manex, which is uh, one of the biggest online securities company. And we saw the people struggling about uh, having a worry about money. So we thought we should have developed some new financial innovation services uh, by technology. Now we have uh, two main services. The one main service is the PFM, Personal Financial Management Tools for individual customers. And now we have the, the number of the users exceeded like six million users and the number one PFM service in Japan. And second service is uh, for SMEs. We provide uh, SaaS services, uh, cloud accounting, invoice, payroll, and expenses for SMEs. Now, I think we have also top, uh, top share in Japan. So uh, in 2017, we went, on, we went public. So we, Money for Art became a num uh, first fintech company, fintech startup company in Japan. Now, I think the, the market uh, welcomed us very much. And now still, you know, keep, keep going, developing, and expanding our business. And just, so IPO is just started. Thank you very much. OK, good, great. So our exam, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Naoki at uh, Merukari. I'm a CEO of Meripay. Meripay is a business, a fintech business unit of Merukari. So I'd like to well, introduce a little bit about the uh, Merukali and Meripay, what we are doing. Uh, yep. So Merukali, as you know, has been providing a marketplace where anyone can buy and sell. 
And I think uh, we have been changing the people's way to well, buy and sell your goods. And so now with MedPay, we would like to expand from the online digital services to offline experiences. So we try to change the, the way you live and also the experience, well, change the experience around the you know, payment. So yeah, well, and I, I just joined this, this FinTech service sector. Uh, actually, I joined Mercali the end of last year. So I'm very new to this, uh, this sector. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Great. OK, um, so uh, the next question is going to be that what are the challenges in your business? And uh, well, first, uh, I, I'd like to start with Tsuji-san, that uh, what are the challenges um, the, in the six years time? There should have been like many hurdles you needed to overcome. And there should have been the things uh, which were not um, you, which were which were which were not going in the way you expected, and also you said that you went through IPO. So before and after IPO, maybe things have changed. So, what are the what are the your challenges in the business? Actually, like ch challenges like the changing actually after IPO and before IPO. So after IPO, so there there is mainly two two challenges we are facing. The first one is to create new innova innovative services, fintech services. And like as Yuko-san said, so we have a lot of data, and not only for individual customers, but also uh, SMEs. So we have a big data. However, we, we, did, we don't create new innovative services based on this data. For example, we are trying to uh, develop new lending services for SMEs by working with Japanese financial uh, institutions. However, it doesn't work very well in, at this time. So we need to create new lending services based on our data, I mean customers' data. And which uh, even Google and Facebook don't have. So the, the creating algorithm of lending and its big challenge, and also like finding the right persons who try to create new service and, you know, don't, um, uh, not afraid of failing, that they're like challenging. So that's big, the biggest challenge would be like a find the right person. So of course we, are, we went public, so we, have, we do have a right people, the good persons, but still we are looking for, you know, like a, uh, the, the people who, is a, who are a deep thinker and who think outside of the box. So maybe these people come from uh, the another industry, not financial area. So these things like the creating new innovative service and also finding right person. These things is a big challenge for me, for us. I think it truly is a challenge for the legacy institution like ours that uh, the, we really need to change the way we think and uh, we really need to change, like they, they, there have been like so many traditional ways of doing the things and it's not very easy to change people's mindset. But if you don't do that, you can never make an innovation. So I'm mean, like, it, how to like promote those type of innovative thinking and how to like change the people would be, should be a challenge. Are you doing anything to change your people in your com company? That's a good question. So actually, <laughs> I don't have right answers. <laughs> so that's why I'm looking for the good people. <laughs> but however, the, 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 the key is to correct people have different background. So of course, financial institutions and IT and big data and maybe detail. And also like UX, user experience is most important part for FinTech players and FinTech services. So when I play Pokemon, and the po Pokemon is great service actually. For so I was thinking like po I we would like to create money for service like Pokemon Go, so like entertainment. So it should be the people from the game you know game industry like Aoyagi san. That's very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Aoyagi san. How about like challenges for you? On what are the challenges for you? Yeah, we face a lot of challenges, but uh, I agree with Yosuke. Well, uh, the biggest challenge is uh, actually forming a great team well, with a scale. Because uh, as you can see with Alipay or WeChat Pay, the service is really complicated. 
well, not complicated, but well, the scale of the service is really big. It's not simple payment service. It's uh, actually highly integrated the financial service platform. So now at MerPay, we have 50 people. But this year, we plan to expand the, the size of the organization from 50 to 300. <laughs> but it's, it's still the, the you know, year one. Well, just compared to the global players like Chinese players, uh, also in Southeast Asia, Grab is doing GrabPay, Tokopedia, that's Toko Cash. So this is the kind of the global big trend. And uh, we have to make a big bet on that. <laughs> if it's too small, well, it's got to be like really fragmented fintech companies. So that's the kind of, well, the thing I'm, you know, thinking every day. And so I'm actually every day meeting at least uh, two, three people to do interview. Uh, well, to convince, uh, to actually make them believe the future, the MailPay has been sending all the people and candidates to China to see what's going on. It's actually cashless. You don't have to. And, and cash is actually useless in China. So without seeing that, it's really hard to believe that's coming. But I believe that's coming. So that's the biggest challenge. OK. Uh, well, cash is my product, actually, the Bank of Japan's <laughs> product. Cash so, is your product, um, right? Exactly. <laughs> so if you see the cashless society, you can hire me, I think. OK, anyway. So uh, the, the, the fragmentation is the word you raised, and which is really what's happening in Japan, I think. Especially in the retail front, we see so many services, payment services, credit cards, debit cards, so many contactless cards, I and mean, you have Suica, Pasmo, and everything, right? And like, it's like, well, users are like confused, I would say. Like, it's just so fragmented. And, and there are so many incumbent, not, not only those cashless payment companies, but also banks as well. So how do you want to deal with the incumbents, like the big, big banks and also the, uh, the, the succeeding, the big companies who are doing the cashless payments and also offering some other financial services? Do you want to fight with them, kick them out, or do you want to collaborate with them? So uh, please, Tsuji-san. I, I, I don't want to fight with banks. <laughs> they are too big. Well, so I think this like story depend on like customer needs actually. So we often work with a Japanese bank, and I strongly believe that like Japanese bank, especially local bank, they know they need to change their way of doing and the cost structure. You know, like they don't need many branches in front of you know the the stations. That's why the very well-known local banks, such as Shizuoka Bank or like Hokuyo Bank, invest in us and also to collaborate to provide a new fintech service to the customers. So Japanese banks have uh, like a trust and also loyal customer base, which like the other countries' banks doesn't have. I, I believe. So I think it's a good way to work with the Japanese bank and win-win based on win-win model. But the, the first thing is, yeah, I, I strongly believe like the Japanese fintech um, is not, it's different from that in China and in the United States, I think. That's a very interesting point. Um, I think uh, the, the treatment of the data or the concern about the data privacy is very different in Japan from China, and um, it's very different like in elsewhere in the world, I think, so that we really need to think Japan's way to develop a fintech, I think. So how about you, uh, the, the how do you deal with incumbents? Oh, yeah, so I'd like to say two things. The first thing is uh, we have to make the user experience much better. So that's the, I, th I think, the point. You know, well, of course, uh, you know, th there are many ways well, to achieve that. So, but Melkali has been really focusing on user experiences. So that's, uh, I think, uh, one of the reasons why we've been really successful in marketplace side. So that part we are really focusing on. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, fragment services that you have to go to the branch, bank branch, or you know, security branch. So that should be changed. Well, but 
uh, the second thing I'd like to say is we are still a star small startup. Even we are hiring a lot of people this year, next year. But well, we understand we have to focus on where we are you know, good at. And also we have to collaborate with the companies. They have a lot of uh, knowledge in the past you know, many decades. So for example, like we can be a branch of large incumbents. And then you know, we are actually well, helping the, especially on the user engagement side. We gotta be a kind of gateway to their services. And then on the financial instrument side, uh, you know, we haven't been doing like making financial products like insurance or the investment, well, the uh, instruments. So those parts, I think we can collaborate. And also to make the, to accelerate the, this you know, change, well, we actually have to have a you know, scale and also, we have to share the kind of well, the benefit and profit with other players. So, yeah, at that point, we have to be be very wise and smart. That's very interesting uh, to hear that. But you said that you are moving from online to offline. That's like uh, the in China, I mean, the Chinese way I'm mean, saying it's O2O of online to offline, and. Um, Bringing the online user experience to offline is not a very easy job, but you got to anyway do it. And then, like whether you can convince your consumers to go offline using your services will be a key to success, I think. So uh, that's that's really good to hear. So uh, we have six minutes left. That means like three minutes each for you to talk about your dream beyond your business. If you have a free hand. In three years' time, five years' time, even ten years' time, what would you like to achieve? It, it doesn't need to be limited to the fintech area. It can be like your personal life, whatever. But may, please tell me your dream. My, my dream. Yeah. So we we started money for just six years ago. So we are still doing that. So like uh, so our mission is you know as I said, move people right forward through our services. So, and also like our mission, our vision is to be number one money platform in Japan. And uh, not only in Japan, but also like overseas. So actually we are, uh, we are expanding our business in especially Asia. For example, we invest in the uh, number one Indonesian HR company and as the main investors. And also we are looking for the the, the opportunity to enter the market in Asia as well. Like, so in terms of like PFM services and also cloud accounting services. So our, so be, to achieve our mission, our vision, and to, to be number one platform in Asia. And, and so I, I strongly believe that technology brings, uh, technology improves people's life very much. And so I, I believe technology. So I, 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 I really enjoy like developing new services and to create new worlds. So that's, so I hope my money for art become a very, uh, how do you say, like the visionary company like Sony and Toyota. And they, because when I was university student, I traveled overseas. And everybody, everybody said like Sony's product is great or Toyota's car is great. So I would like to uh, create money for like Sony and Toyota's, like, not like a product, but like uh, financial services. That's great. That's a good ambition. How about you, Aoyaki-san? Yeah, I have many dreams in three years, five years, 10 years, because five years ago, Melikali marketplace didn't exist. <laughs> so anything can happen in five years, 10 years time frame. Yeah. So in two years, three years, we want to see the city where people can buy and sell offline without cash. I mean, papers and coins. And to, you know, by seeing that, well, I think a Japanese people believe, oh, that's coming, that's happening. And the, you know, much better life is actually coming. So without seeing that, well, it's very difficult to change the people's mindset and behavior and the way they live. But the, you know, anything can happen if you, you know, look at Uber, Airbnb, you know, they change the you know, way of life. 
So that's the you know, first thing in short term we want to do. And the, I'm more interested in how other industry and services are changing after that, especially with the cashless payment infrastructure. In China, there's a big wave called the uh, new retail. So, for example, like if you go to Lawson, Family Mart, or Seven Eleven, in China, you don't have to line up. You don't have to pay. Just you grab something you want, and then you just go out and check out. That's it. So much better experience. At hotels, you still have to check in and check out. You don't have to do it. Uh, you know, the, we have kind of credit scrolling that support your right, trust and credit. So you can just, just go enjoy, you know, grab lunch and then well, without payment or without any experience or any, any interaction with people. So that's the, the you know, change we want to see after cashless well, the payment. And then I, as a you know, one of the Japanese, uh, I would like to create the industries after 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. Everybody is talking about 2020 Olympic, uh, 20 Olympic Games, but I'm, I'm highly concerned about the economy and the society after the Tokyo Olympic Games. We don't have a clear plan to grow. So we have to actually complete the change of the, those uh, fintech and those experiences before Olympic Games. That's kind of the, the, my dream and also the kind of the passion. That's really great to hear, because uh, the last Olympic we had, it's like 50 some years ago. After that, we went to into serious recession because uh, we really didn't have a clear vision to grow our economy after that. But uh, we really need to have that, as you said, that we need to use Olympic as an excuse to develop ourselves and change ourselves and try to prepare for the future so that we can see the better world, even after the Olympic, and we can just transform ourselves into the better world, that's true. And even though uh, the, we are enjoying the great services from the incumbent financial institutions, it is not enough at this moment, and it will not be enough in the future for sure, because we are observing the deteriorating demography with less people, less services for sure. So we need to make ourselves improve to raise our efficiency to become more com convenient. That's true. So the time is now and we need to change the world. That's true. Well, this is the end of the panel. Thank you very much for the participation. Thank you very much. Thank, for you, very panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.